Welcome back, All The Smoke, episode eight, man. Got a super special guest, man. I don't get excited for too much shit. Y'all know that. The honorable. But this dude right here, man, welcome. My oh, man. Appreciate you. That's so an honor, man. Thank you. Know you. It, man. Appreciate, Appreciate you coming. Had to be here for y'all. Oh, you yeah, know that. Do Hold on. I, I do have a question. Can I start yeah, off with on, a question? Come on, you don't want to be an interview? What you mean? Why am I on the couch with you, but he's sitting in the king seat? Like, I mean, dang. Well, well you know what? I'm just wondering. I'm not going to explain to you, and I'm going to explain to the okay, world. Okay, sure. <laughs> I just was curious. Yeah. You know both of us are great team players. Right. We both play in our role. That's right. I play, I play a great role of feeding off him. Right. And that's the better seat as far as the production and all that. So he, he belongs there. I belong oh here. My God. He is that you know? dude. I belong here. <laughs> you know, he is that He's dude. That, that is true. He's that, that is guy. true. Calm and mellow, all that on yeah. court stuff. It's different. Yeah, it's different. They don't even know. Uh, they don't even no know. <laughs> <laughs> that's my guy. That's right. But let's get to it, man. Sure. Tell us. I mean, I compare you to an athlete from a standpoint of you're recognized everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. uh, we know all the basics, but tell us who Stephen A. Smith is from your upbringing right here in New York. Native of Hollis, Queens, born in the Bronx, raised in Queens. Um, I raised by the greatest mom in the world, God rest her soul. She passed away a couple of years ago after a long battle with cancer. Uh, she was married to my dad for. 60, 61 years. Mm -hmm. um, the old school. Love. That's her old school, old school. You know, he, you know, he and I had our differences because, you know, he could have treated her better, but he's still my dad and I loved him. Um, but because of that, I was extra tight with her. Mm -hmm. And I was the youngest of six, had an older brother. He died in a car accident in Waco, Texas in 1992. He was like in this van. He was a salesman, traveling salesman. And it was 15 people in one of those sales vans. Mm. And the driver was messing with the radio and stuff like that. And um, it flipped over numerous times. And he was the only one that died. That's funny. I was going to ask you about That's that. That's right. He was you were only. 25. That's right. My brother was 25. I was 24. Six. I was 24, yeah. And I was, my brother was 25 when he died. Right. And I was 16. Yeah. And I know that effect in my life. So I'm, oh. I'm hearing you talk about it now. And cra it, 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 was, it was crazy altering because, first of all, you, you start questioning a lot of things. It's like you growing up and this is your big brother who supported you. I got left back in the fourth grade because I got a first grade reading level. I remember cats in the neighborhood laughing at me, laughing like I was a dummy, I was an idiot or whatever. And the reason why I bring that up is because if there's ever anything that inspired me, that made me hungry, it was making sure that that laughter would never arrive again. Mm -hmm. So the reason why it's relatable to this conversation, talking to y'all who I've been interviewing for years right. as NBA players, is that I've always been no nonsense, right. but I've always been straight. You know, you see me coming. If right. I got an issue with you, I'm gonna let you know. If I got something I gotta report you ain't gonna like, I'm gonna tell you, you know, right. all of that other stuff. All of that stuff comes from, believe it or not, that. Because when people were laughing, they weren't just laughing in front of your face, they were laughing behind your back. They were ridiculing you. They were minimizing you and diminishing you. And then somehow, some way, they would come in your face and they would smile and then act like they were supportive of you and they weren't. So I was always the kind of person growing up knowing that my mother was straight with me, but sometimes you had relatives that weren't straight for you, friends that weren't right. straight with you. I always prided myself in being the person that would be straight. That would be fear. You'd see me coming. You right. might not like it, right. but I will always hit you here. Gotta respect that it wouldn't beat you in the back. Right. It wouldn't beat you, it would be right here. Yep. And so that same approach is what I took with me wherever I went. And so I went to school and I was stupidly telling my mother I didn't want to go to college, so she made me go to a trade school, Thomas Edison Vocational and Technical High School right here in Queens where I learned electrical installation. But then they discovered I could play some ball. I wasn't as good as y'all, but I could ball. I could shoot and I had heart. And so I got a scholarship to Winston-Salem State, but it was after I did junior college at FIT, which was Fashion Institute of Technology. They used to <laughs> laugh at me about it, right? They laughed at me about it, but I had two things going for us. You learned something. That's right. Oh, no, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. But here's the deal. I, la I had two advantages. Number one, we were 35 and four as a junior college, ranked 15th in the nation. Okay. And number two... All, it was primarily a girl's school, mm. and the other dudes were homosexuals. Oh. Now, that's their business. Don't get me wrong. Right, right. But what I'm saying is for, for those you. of us who were not, yeah, right in my alley. it left it all to us, <laughs> the basketball team. So college was beautiful to I me. Love, yeah. And that was before I went down to Winston-Salem and playing for Big House Gaines. And when I tried out for him, one of the guys that 
used to play at the university at Winston-Salem. His name was Harold Funny Kit, played in the 70s, brought me down there for a tryout. And coach put me on the squad against the starters, and I hit 17 straight three-pointers. Mm. Signed me the scholarship on the, on spot, the spot, you know, but my first year there, cracked my kneecap in half. Mm. When I cracked my kneecap in half, first of all, I was, I was down there at 145 pounds. You was a little fella. I was a little, please. Yeah, a little fella. So that's bad enough then, but then I cracked my kneecap in half. It was a D2 school, so they didn't have the facilities like the big schools that's had right. to help you rehabilitate. Yeah. Had to come home for rehab and all of that other stuff. And my mother said, well, what you going to do? And sure enough, I could write, I could report, um, I could do all of those different things. And a critical and persuasive writing teacher saw me and said, you're a born sports writer. Let me take you out to lunch no. next week and talk about it. And I didn't know, but he took me out to lunch. It was with the sports editor for the Winston-Salem Journal. He took me to his office. The man met me, hired me within five minutes to start off as a clerk and everything. And then Working I just right. went from doing that to being a beat writer for Wake Forest Soccer to ultimately doing internships in Winston-Salem, Greensboro, Atlanta, before getting my first job at the New York Daily News as a high school sports reporter. Stayed there for 14 months. Philadelphia Inquirer came calling. Mm -hmm. I did, went there, got promoted like nine times, covered AI <laughs> every day for yeah, like the first the six move. years of his career, the whole bit. And that's basically it. Right. Yeah, it's basically it. Well, tell me, tell me about in the 80s. Yeah. Growing up with the basketball in the 80s out here in New York. Tell me what oh, that was man, like. listen, let me tell you something. Well, first of all, see, to me, I grew up idolizing Dwayne Pearl Washington. God Ooh, rest his soul. Washington. Pearl was something special. To me, he was the greatest college ball player I, I'd ever seen. Michael Jordan and everybody was like, they was, don't get me wrong, they were on another level eventually. But yeah. on the collegiate level at that time, when this brother rolled into Syracuse, I, I'm telling you right now, I remember my, one of my most memorable moments watching Dwayne Pearl Washington was when he lost the Big East title to Mark Jackson and St. John. Mm. Mark Jackson, Walter Berry, Willie Glass, mm -hmm. all of those cats at, at the Garden. And it was the last play. They had, I think it was either Jackson or Willie Glass. I think it was Mark Jackson. He had hit a jump shot. And the next thing you know, it's only a few seconds left. And Dwayne Pearl Washington grabbed the ball and pushed it up the court. And literally danced through five dudes and then went in for a layup and then missed like the back of the rim at the last <laughs> All you could remember was that this kid's handle was so nasty. Yeah. I remember Gene Smith at Georgetown was considered this defensive eight and Pearl, you know, buckled him to his knees and whole bit. So I grew up in that era watching Dwayne Pearl Washington, watching Kenny Anderson, Rod mm -hmm. Strickland, yeah. Mark Jackson, obviously, in the whole bit. So that was the era that I grew up in. And, and playing ball at that time, just traveling in the streets and everything like that, you had to have heart. Mm -hmm. You had to have heart, and you was going up against cats from all over the country. Well, they had heart, too. Mm -hmm. New York thought it was it, but then you, what you really got a sense of, New York City cats could ball one-on-one. -on -one. But that team. actual team concept, yeah, yeah. other places it was had hard. advantages. Other places had advantages because in New York, it was the hardwood. It was Rutgers Park. You could go to Staten Island. You can go to Brooklyn. You could go right here on West 4th Street, Rutgers, uh, Harlem 135th, and Lenox. You had all of those places, and you had cats who could dance and be one-on-one. -on -one. But part of our problem as New York basketball players was discipline. You know, playing within a team structure, mm -hmm. not taking over, taking control, believing that you were it. The dudes that got that mm -hmm. were the successful ones. Mm -hmm. The the Kenny Andersons, the Stephon Marbury's, Marbury's yeah. at one point, yeah. stuff like that. I always knew Marbury was going to be better than Felipe Lopez. I wasn't caught up in that. <laughs> <laughs> that was he was now, the man. He was the man at St. Really John's, man. bro. He was, he was the man. He was the man because he went to Rice, and I was a high school sports writer for the New York Daily News at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was the first one that wrote the article. Y'all keep talking about this cat Felipe. It's this dude here, Stephon Marbury, that's going to be special. Because when I looked at Felipe, I pay attention to nice, sleek frame, defend, defended, was fundamentally sound, mm -hmm. but did not have a reliable jump shot. At and all. Said, at all. And I said, that is not Marbury's problem. Mm -hmm. Marbury could get to the hole at will. He can pull up from 20, 25 feet. He got a handle. He could pass. He was a pure point guard and didn't mind ripping you apart while playing a mm -hmm. team game. Mm -hmm. So I always knew he was going to be better. But it was cats like Kareem Reed that played Kareem at St. Reed. Raymond's and yeah. ultimately went to uh, Arkansas. Arkansas, right? yeah. All yeah. Of the, I mean, Thurman, these yeah. are the guys that I grew up watching. Like, God, Sham, God, mm -hmm. Wells. Mm -hmm. yes. He was all world with Hiller. the handle. Hiller. But the jump shot was suspect. Never if there. God, Sham, God had a jump shot, 
I'm telling you right now, it would have been. And it, you still couldn't over. guard him. And you, you still, still couldn't guard him. <laughs> he was the closest thing to Pearl. Really? In terms of his handle, in terms of his handle, what he yeah. could do with his ball handling skill, but he couldn't finish from the perimeter. That was his problem. Speaking yeah. of Sham God, one of my twins, we were in AAU tournament one time when they were 10 years old, and he pulled the Sham God, and I right. blew my mind. And right. it worked, and he hit it, and passed was my other twin, right. he hit it corner three, and I asked him, I was like, you know, but you know what that move's called? Who made that move up? I just seen CP3 do it, Dad. Like uh -huh. they don't understand yeah, where lineage and where it comes right. from, and that kind of somewhere. and that kind of takes me back to you seen from the legends in New York to the early 80s of the NBA, the 90s, 2000s, to what the game is today. Walk us through that transition of style of play and what you think about it from now to then. Well, I think that, listen, in the 80s, again, because I was playing and I was young and I wasn't a journalist, all you saw is where you were at. Right. Mm -hmm. So you in New York, you saw New York. Mm -hmm. But we New Yorkers, so we think we know. <laughs> you see what I'm yeah, yeah. We think we know, right. but we don't really know. Right. Because unless you're traveling, you really, really don't know. And again, that individuality came to it. You saw more of a team concept in the 90s because, remember, from a, from a collective standpoint, team-oriented standpoint, when you think basketball in the 80s, you thought Hoya Paranoia. You thought John Thompson, mm -hmm. Ewing, Michael Graham, Michael, you know, Michael mm -hmm. Jackson, point guard, Reggie Williams was mm -hmm. nasty. Nice. He Reggie could play all of those cats, right? So you had that, but their signature was defense. They could shut you down and literally rip your heart out of your chest. They scared the living hell out of you. That's Villanova, exactly. that's right, there you go. Villanova with the four corners, Ed Pinckney, McLean, and those boys. That might have disrupted them that one thing, and they held the damn ball for the whole damn final for the national championship right. game. But it was what it was, okay? And then, of course, you saw St. Sarah Q, St. John's, all of those cats coming uh, with Kenny Anderson. Remember, Lethal the Weapon 3, Georgia Tech with Georgia Ron Tech. Oliver, Dennis mm -hmm. Scott, Dennis 3D, Scott. the whole crew. You saw all of that. So that was going into the 90s. Even though you saw individuality, what to me really took it to another level was talk and UNLV, Greg Anthony, mm -hmm. Stacey Augman, Larry mm -hmm. Johnson, and the crew. Yeah. You saw all of these guys, right? They defended and they played together. And even though I'm not sure people really think about it the way that I do, I give Larry Johnson a whole lot of credit oh, yeah. because he was miniature in height, but he was massive, big, yep. strong, and he was a man amongst boys in the low post. Yes. But he was the ultimate team yep. player. Sacrificed he didn't lot. care. Mm -hmm. He could score nope. and would give you his 20 on any given night, but other nights when other cats were doing their thing, he was absolutely fine. Greg Anthony took pride in defending you Anderson 94 Hunt. feet and putting you on lockdown. Anderson Hunt yes. could shoot from three. Yeah. Stacy Augman would mm -hmm. dunk on I your face man. one minute and <laughs> then block your man. shot and right. D you up another. <clears throat> so when you had all of this going on, okay, then remember, they were the rebels. We called Georgetown the rebel, mm -hmm. you know, rebellious yeah. rebels. Yeah. Oh, the running rebels. But the real, real rebels, rebels on the West Coast. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, right. So you see all of that happening. And you see them go against Duke and annihilate them by 30 for the national championship. The next year comes out, they got Grand Hill this time. Mm -hmm. They face UNLV in the semifinal, and they take UNLV out. Very, very close game, but mm -hmm. they took them out. And that's where Hurley and Christian Layton and those boys ascended. When you saw that, you start, I believe, that was the transition to a more team concept only from this perspective. You saw white cats, because obviously Larry Bird let you know white boys can play so, too, mm -hmm. make no mistake about it. You saw that and you had the respect. But in the same breath, that was as an individual. Right. Collectively, you didn't think a collection of them was Wait, going I'm to take you out, no. right? Even though we all know who know basketball, you don't win, beat that UNLVT mm -hmm. without Grand mm -hmm. Hill. We couldn't take away from the heart that Hurley and Leighton yeah, show and going up Absolutely. against them. Right. So you saw cats, and even though, again, the game was individualized to a strong degree because of the 80s and because of the ascension of Michael Jordan, you know, because you remember you had Magic and Bird going at it, mm -hmm. and even though they were the marquee dudes that were being advertised, they played for elite teams. Right. So there was a team concept. It was Jordan that individualized mm -hmm. stuff in our eyes. Yep. And so we got caught up in the Jordan, the Jordan, the Jordan, then it was in 92 that we got reminded of Hurley late in the team. And so now you started really, really thinking about basketball the way it should have been right. thought about all along. You start looking at individual talent, 
but how they mesh with the team. And then you get into the finances because you didn't have a rookie salary cap at the same rookie wage scale. You got Big Dog coming out of Purdue. He signed for 69 million. It was 69 million. 60, okay. It was 69. He wanted 100. He wanted 100. He got 69. Okay. Webb got close to 100, didn't he? See Webb? See Webb? Yeah, I think so. Later yeah. on. But what, mm -hmm. what, what, what happened is it was Big Dog, number one. Then you had Grant Hill and Jason Kidd yeah. both getting pretty much the same amount of dollars, yep. right? Then you had um, C. Webb coming out, but same time as Penny Hardaway, all right? That rookie wage scale, again, wasn't in full effect at that particular moment in time. So you were still able to look at things from a team concept, right. but in the same breath, you started paying attention to the individuals who couldn't help it because of the money individuals right. were getting paid. But again, even though Big Dog was a scoring machine, mm -hmm. these guys were relatively unselfish. Him, especially Grant yeah. Hill yeah. and Jason Kidd didn't care if he scored at all. Right. He would be happy giving you 15, 20 assists a night if he could. Mm -hmm. So when you saw that, it heightened the level of team concept, having that mentality. And to me, it really, really changed the way things happened because when you saw these cats getting that money as number one, number two, number three overall pick, on one hand, you wanted the money as an individual, but the people that were bringing you on board, insisting that you fit into a team System, concept, yeah, yeah. what happened is it sort of changed your mindset because we, you had cats like yourself and others, not literally y'all at the mm -hmm. time, but figuratively speaking, guys like y'all looking at the game from a business perspective. Okay, why should I make this sacrifice? What's in it for me? Mm -hmm. This cat getting paid, mm -hmm. but the rest of us ain't. Right. And so at, at that point, now you start looking at the business and being reminded what made Magic money, what made Bird money, what made Jordan money, ultimately what was going to make you all money. And you start looking at it and their game really, really transformed from a business mindset right. because I think more business-minded players came into the league at that time than ever before. Around, around our time, and, you, and we are, I do fit in that category because especially after I won the championship in the Spurs, I start looking at teams where I fit into the system. Right. Where I can know I can have some longevity there. And, right. and, and, and the game d did transcend to that because that was a big part of us when we were free agents. We had to find out where we fit. We right. just couldn't go anywhere. Right. No, it's definitely, people don't understand how important, I mean, if we're getting into this area that being drafted in a certain organization or situation fits. Now you had that when someone asked, a fan asked a question, if KG was drafted to the Spurs and him right. and Tim Duncan switched spots, who is the greatest power forward of all time, and do they have the same success with KG and Pop? For me personally, I'm able to look, being a student of basketball the way that I am, I'm able to look at things in a different light. Like, for example, KG was special, but his frame and the style of play he preferred, I don't think that would have been more successful in San Antonio than Tim Duncan was. I don't believe that. Tim Duncan, to me, is is the greatest power forward who ever played basketball. <gasps> that's how I view it. I ain't got to say that. Uh, no th that's how I view it. Now, why do I say that? Because for me, from a principled perspective, the word power forward matters. You're a four. Even though you can have an outside game and step away from the basket, right. like KG did, right. like Chris Bosh ultimately did, like Blake Griffin still tries to do, right. the fact of the matter is, is that, excuse me, I got news for both of y'all, and I challenge anybody to deny this is true. Take away Tim Duncan, who's the best power forward that ever lived. You know who I would say? Kevin McHale. Mm. Money in the post. Nice. 10 and in, so much, unstoppable. So Up work. and under, unstoppable. It was an automatic two points. What I'm saying to you is that if you are a quote unquote power forward, I'm not talking about the hybrid game that they've yeah. inserted into the mixed head where they've changed the positions, they've renamed it, and they want to tell you forward, this is what it right. is. You want to hear all that? Right. When you talk about the position, point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center, power forward spot, Tim Duncan hated it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Hate it when you put him at the five. Hate it being listed at the Hated five. It. Wanted no parts of it. He knew what he was. And when you gave that brother the ball, it didn't matter whether he was facing the basket or whether his back was to the basket. You put that brother 17 feet and in, mm, it was a nightmare. He gonna, and he's going to make the right decision. It was a nightmare. Yep. Mm -hmm. It was a nightmare. And so for me, when I look at KG, when I look at KG as being an elite talent, who happened to play power forward mm -hmm. that had perimeter skills. Right. But he wasn't no prototypical quintessential power forward the way Tim that Duncan Tim Duck was. Even when KG 
had his back to you, he was still looking for the turnaround right. jump shot. Mm -hmm. Tim Duncan might dunk it on you. Mm -hmm. He might lay up it in under. on you. He might, he might fake over. go up on <laughs> under. He might cross you. He right. might hook you. He might shoot a turnaround, shoot a bank shot. Yeah. It was an arsenal, the likes of which we haven't seen. Right. And that's how I look at Tim Duncan. And that's why I would say he is the greatest power forward that I've ever seen. Along with 10 rebounds and eight blocks and 10 was, assists. He like he do it all. He was a monster. Yes, he was. Let's go back to 94, um, kind of when you started your professional career. Sure. Tell us, uh, tell us what that was like because, you know, people always, like I said, I, I kind of compare you to an athlete from a standpoint, they see the finished product. They see you on ESPN mm -hmm. and all the success you're having now, but right. your journey was anything but the journey. Well, listen, man. <laughs> People, when they've written these articles about me, I lived off of tuna fish and Kool-Aid to start my Preach. career. I'm from New York City. I'm from the streets of Hollis, Queens, New York City. And I was working in Archdale, North Carolina for the Greensboro News and Record. I started off as an editorial assistant doing agate material and school lunch menus. What's agate? Like in, in, a, in, a, in a sports department for a newspaper, all of these little things that you see where they shows you a sheet with the scores and everything like that. Yeah. Computer from a digital perspective is things that formulate a page and stuff like that. And you gotta type all of that stuff in there just to make sure it's framed correctly and it fits in the paper. If you do it wrong here, wrong there, the copy comes mm. off the paper. It ain't good, you gotta make sure it fits, yeah. all of this stuff. Yeah. So I had to do all of those things, right? And that was in my daytime when I was getting paid. And then I would get off at six and drive throughout the tri-state, uh, you know, the, the Piedmont Triad area in North Carolina, covering high school football from 7 p.m. until midnight for free. I didn't get paid for it. I did it just to accumulate clips to build a resume to show that I was really committed to being a sports writer. That led to internships in Atlanta back at Winston-Salem before I got the high school sports writing job at the New York Daily News. So then when you get into the business, um, Isaiah Thomas and I are tight to this very day. He forgot why. And one day, a few years <laughs> ago, I told Isaiah, I said, you, don't, you, you forgot who you are. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you gave me my first interview. Mm -hmm. Isaiah Thomas was approaching his retirement year mm -hmm. with the Detroit Pistons. He was a two-time champion. I was a high school writer. Wow. And a guy by the name of Tim Donovan, who does media relations PR for the Miami Heat mm -hmm. all of these years. Tim was working under Pat Riley doing the Knicks at the time. I was a high school sports writer. You ain't supposed to have access to those. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But Tim, yeah, but Tim knew I wanted to be an NBA writer. And Tim Donovan was like, come on, mm -hmm. I'll help you out. And gave me access to the locker room. You know, he didn't have to do that. Right. So he gave, me, he, he gave me access to it. And obviously I knew my place, so I wasn't trying to get in the way or whatever. I was just watching, studying, learning, et cetera, et cetera. And one day Isaiah Thomas came in as still, uh, before he retired with the Pistons, and he was doing interview with the media. And I said to him, I'm an aspiring sports writer. It would really help me if mm -hmm. I could get an interview with you. He said, can you do it now? And sat down with me and gave That's me a 25-minute wow. interview. Uh, Nate Tiny Archibald did the same exact thing for me once I became a full-time high school sports writer. So it's like I didn't get here by accident, but I didn't get here by myself. Mm -hmm. There was a whole lot of people that extended me a helping hand. When I was at the Winston-Salem Journal, it was an all-white staff led by Terry Oberly, but I still remember the copy editors of this very day, Dan Lohman, Steve Mann, Phil Rishak, and all of these guys that I haven't seen in years that I haven't worked with in nearly 30 years. But they were the guys that would sit me down and say, okay, this is a piss poor job. You wrote this sentence wrong. You wrote that graph wrong. You missed this fact, this fact, that fact. And they literally taught me journalism. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, when you go through those experiences and you see the work that was put in in order to get people to where they are and how they extended a helping hand. Listen, I ain't just a black man. I'm a brother. Right. You see what I'm saying? So you're not expecting a bunch of white cats to extend their helping hand. Know. But when they did that, it, it all world. of a sudden is like, whoa, you mm -hmm. know what? You're looking at the world a little bit differently because you're like, you're reminded that, yeah, we different, but we the same. Right. And everybody got a heart and everybody's God fearing and everybody's got compassion and stuff like that. And they want to extend a helping hand to other people. And that's what they did for me. And all they asked in return is that I didn't make make sure make I made sure not to make their effort 
be in vain. Mm -hmm. When you go, don't, you don't said you wanted to go for this, that's right. why we helped you. Go for it. So even to this day, nobody's more prouder than me than those guys. And you'll see a guy like Isaiah Thomas. I get a text from Isaiah Thomas every month. It's one of the biggest reasons why, because he remembered after I told him, started. this is what you helped mm -hmm. start me. And right. he remembered what I said. So it's, it's like being true to what you do. And again, it dictates the approach to some degree because you know the sacrifices that you made. I remember when a cat came, you know, they, they came to me and they wanted me uh, to have a job in Seattle. I was going to go unless the New York Daily News came. Mm -hmm. They had a job for me in, 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 in Fresno. I was going to go yeah. unless, unless the New York Daily News came. It was like no matter what, whatever the sacrifices that are that need to be made, I, I, I think to this very day, I've never been married because of that. Because I was right. always ready to it's get right. up and go. Well, because does. when you're growing up and you poor and you're living off tuna fish and Kool-Aid from the time you're in college, you taste government cheese and bread when you're younger. You sat up there and watched your mother work two jobs, seven days a week, 16 hours a day for 20 years with one week's vacation nonstop. You go through all of that, it's not that love don't matter. It's not that family don't matter. It's nothing like that. It's that I'm not going back to that. You right. become numb to a lot of stuff. And whatever, whatever sacrifices need to be made, I'm going to make to mm -hmm. get ahead. Mm -hmm. And that's always been my approach. So when I talk to professional athletes, particularly those of us that are professional athletes, black folks, I'm sitting there like, I know your story. Mm -hmm. I've been mm -hmm. through really it. lived it. But there's a flip side to it. The same dude that's going to support you because I get your story is the same dude that's going to hold you accountable because right. I know your story. Right. Right. So when you sit up there and you doing stupid shit, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's compromising everything you worked for. Yeah. Few are going to be harder on you than me because I know what you went through to get there. And you just going to blow it for that? Right, right. That's how I'm looking at it. And that's been my approach throughout my entire professional career as I report on these guys. Mm -hmm. So what have been some of the major obstacles, so to speak, within this profession? Well, first of all, you, you, you don't want to use the word racism because it's not that people are saying you black, so I'm going to hold you down. And it's that simple all mm -hmm. the time. <laughs> it happens, mm -hmm. but it's not just that. Sometimes it's the kind of person they want you to be. Yeah. Sometimes it's what they think they can get out of it. Sometimes it's, okay, it's not your turn. Like, when I thought about, for example, let me get political with y'all for a second in this regard. One of the things that I always held against the Democratic Party, for example, was when Hillary Clinton ran against Trump this time around. What was my issue? Nothing to do with politics. To me, and it's not her I'm talking about, I'm talking about in general, the mindset was it's her turn. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that's the same thing that exists in corporate America. There, nobody is getting ahead without a helping hand. Right. Mm -hmm. There is always someone in a position of power that you need to be a champion and a supporter of yours. You will not ascend on your own volition. No I don't give a damn how good you are. I don't give a damn how talented you are. You better know somebody. Right. And it better be somebody in a position of influence who's interested in helping you. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. Understand. It's just not going to happen, right? So I say all of that to say somewhere along the way, not that it's the core decision maker, but as somebody that's respected and connected enough where if they champion you, yeah. it's a big boost for you. Mm -hmm. You got to make sure you have that. That's why when I give speeches, I talk about it ain't just about having a mentor. It's about having an, a cheerleader as well. You need both. Mm -hmm. you, do, you do need somebody that prevents you from falling in that abyss and staying there. But you also need somebody that's attached to the industry you're aspiring to, you're right. aspiring to excel in. Mm -hmm. They're connected enough to guide you through the minefields. You need both. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was always my approach. And, but again, to address the obstacles question. The problem that you run across sometimes, particularly when you're younger and talented, they want to hold you back because there was always somebody else in line Ahead waiting you. to get where you are. Mm -hmm. They might have been older, mm -hmm. supposedly paid more dues or mm -hmm. anything like that. And what I'm mindful and cognizant of is what wins. If they've been there that long and they, and they haven't still succeeded, haven't got there yet, there's and they a still reason. haven't gotten it yet, doesn't that tell you there's something? A reason. Shouldn't that tell you that? Common maybe sense. Just, maybe they ain't the chosen one. Right. You have people in positions of power that resist that thought. 
Their mentality is to make you wait because they had to wait. And sometimes it's appropriate, mm -hmm. but a lot more often than we realize, it's not. People are ready. And so having those obstacles, there was plenty of people. He don't need to be a beat writer yet. He don't need to be an NBA columnist yet. Mm. He doesn't need, at the time that I became the 21st African American in the history of this country, to be a general sports columnist in March of 2003. They were like, nah, he don't need that yet. When I said, there's a lot of things you telling me I don't need. Mm. But you capitalizing off of what I'm providing. Mm. Do you want to win or not? And so you saw first the Philadelphia Inquirer, then ESPN, ultimately, and ultimately Fox as well, and then ESPN again. Ultimately, you saw them capitalizing on it, and it raised my level of awareness and consciousness because I, it taught me you must have something to offer somebody. They can say whatever they want, right. mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, when you go to these folks, you have to make sure it ain't just about you. This is what I want. Mm -hmm. This is what I deserve. This is what I need. No, there must be something in it for somebody you're asking of something from. Mm -hmm. Because the likelihood of them giving you what you want while getting nothing in return is yeah, slim to none. If it's not beneficial, it's artificial. There you go. Exactly. And that's, and, and, and that's, just, that's just as real as it gets. And so for me... I've when those were the obstacles because my lack of knowledge at the time, you do tend to get caught up. You almost have that athlete's mentality. Man, please, mm -hmm. put them in front of me. I'll mow them down. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? I don't yeah. give a damn who it is. Yeah. But in reality, what I learned, and this is where sports really, really helped my life, and covering guys like yourself helped my life immensely. You sit up there and you look at certain situations, and the athletes themselves teach you how envious and jealous you mm. can be. You can see it. Y'all assume, not literally y'all, but you know what I'm saying, yeah. athletes. Y'all assume it's because of the money. Mm -hmm. Of course that has something to do with it. If you not can pay your that. bills and live a lofty lifestyle compared to reporters that are covering you, of course. But that's not the big thing. The big thing is the freedom you appear to have. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to show up to the games. And yes, you have to show up to practice. But there's so many hours in a day that you just get to live your life and be you. Mm -hmm. And you get to do other things that transcend the world of sports. While so many folks in this world are limited. Very. They're pigeonholed and marginalized in a fashion that they can't escape can't from move. because yeah. they don't have the juice to do it. Mm -hmm. The fact that y'all have the juice to do it is where a real strong level of envy comes mm -hmm. from. And not envy as in jealousy, envy as in why I, wish, I wish I could do that, mm -hmm. but if I can't do that, why can't they appreciate the fact that we can't do it right. and they can right. instead of snubbing their nose at us? Right. That's what a lot of times, see, reporters don't get into these conversations with y'all like that because... Either they feel intimidated, they don't feel you'll hear them, they don't feel you listen. In my opinion, they don't respect y'all enough. Mm -hmm. And my attitude is I've always had respect for it. Y'all know me for years. You know y'all could come talk to me about anything. anything mm -hmm. yeah. let's, let's, let's roll. Which is why, again, I could be hardcore. Because I know, okay, this cat got this going on. I know I didn't report it. Mm -hmm. I know there's limitations to what I'm going to say. Y'all been around me. Y'all know the shit yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of times I'm like, that, yo, I don't do that. This is the game. Right. And I know why you fucked up last night. Mm -hmm. You understand know what I'm saying? <laughs> but that's between us. Yeah, yeah. Now, I might let you know, but yeah. man, handle that. <laughs> yeah. Because you look bad and you need to And I that. know. But I ain't going to say what. Right. But I'm going to let you know. You and I know I what's going on. You, because right. I don't want you to fail. There's no question. I don't want you to fail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's coming from the right place. You got a quote that I'm going to read. Sure. That uh, I thought was very interesting. For the Jay-Z's, LeBron, Shaq's and the others, I don't consider them the American dream. I consider me the American dream. They're the American fantasy. If you, you got a one in a billion shot of being them, but you can, you can be Stephen A. Smith. Yeah. Elaborate on that. It's the truth. Jay-Z, music mogul, billionaire with Beyonce as his wife. Yeah, it is hard to be a billionaire. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Think, I think about it like uh, that. Uh, 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 Sha Shaquille O'Neal, one of the greatest players to have ever lived, four-time champion, seven feet, 315 pounds, doing what he does. The Kobe's, the LeBron's of the world, freaks, ultimate freaks of nature. And even if you could be them as a talent, could you pull off everything they've put, they've pulled off in terms of transcending their business, their world of sports? The world that we live in understands something. They can talk about communism, fascism, and all of this other stuff. I am of the belief that everybody's a capitalist in their own way. 
everybody's trying to get their share. They're not trying to get just their little piece and everybody gets the same. There's something inside of you that says, I got to get more to validate who I am and that I'm not typical. I'm not normal. I'm, not I'm a bit atypical. Yeah. I'm not ordinary. You see what I'm saying? So my point is, is that when you look at those guys, understand that that's not everyday stuff. That's not every year stuff. That's generational stuff that we're talking about for the select few. Me got left back in the fourth grade, first grade reading level, struggled with reading and writing, pounded the pavement, got my education, grew up broke, starved at times, had a poor family, but we stuck together for some reason by the grace of God and the most wonderful mom in the world. All those things happened. And what did I do? Yeah, I'm successful right now. That's fine. I'm 52. I've been in this business since 24. It took me 28 years mm -hmm. to get to the point that I'm at right now. I'm living large now. I'm living good. I'm living large right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but it took 28 years. Yeah. And so for me, it's like, understand you're not them. But look at my path and tell me what is it about my path that you can't accomplish. I'm not trying to say I'm not special, that I didn't accomplish something. Mm -hmm. I'm saying what I accomplished is achievable for a vast majority of folks in this world. Not necessarily monetarily. I've been blessed in that regard as of late. Yeah. But I'm talking about the path that I took to the success. Take away the money for a second and just look at the path. The Who can't do what I did mm -hmm. if you really, really think about it? I, I couldn't be Jay-Z on my worst day, on my best day. LeBron, Kobe, Shaq, people like that. No, but reading and writing and, and, and knowing how to report and busting your tail and studying and just grinding every day, I got this the old-fashioned blue-collar way. And I think a lot of people can achieve that. And I, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question because I understand that more because then a lot of people might not even – Start off with the hand that you was dealt. The right. hand, you know, they might be dealt a better hand. Yeah. So I do, I, I'm glad you asked because I understand the question now because I didn't understand it when you first said right. it. But I definitely understand what so you mean. So what if I told you that you are the Jay Z in your profession? Yeah. <laughs> what if I told you um, to us you are? You're the yeah. LeBron in broadcasting. I would say thank you to y'all. That's not just about me. I'm not saying I had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. But it's like, listen, I tell AI this. AI will call me and, 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 and un undercover-wise, AI an emotional dude. Oh, oh no, no. It, it, it ain't undercover. Hold on, hold on. For, to cut you off, <laughs> it ain't he undercover. calls me once a week and tell me he loves me. That's right. <laughs> once a week. Same here. Same here. He tells me he <laughs> loves me. And, and we love him back, man. Of course. Because AI, AI been Great through dude. a lot, man. Great brother. He's a, he's a, that's, my, that's my little Great brother. Dude. Yeah, no doubt. We're very, we're very, very close. Mm -hmm. And that's saying a lot if you know anything about our history and mm -hmm. some of the things I had to write and right. say. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't, you know, it's shocking that we are as tight, but people don't realize we've always been tight. And a lot of times when we didn't talk is because I I jumped in his butt because of what he was doing, mm -hmm. and I didn't report it, but it didn't stop me from cursing him out, right. going off, because what are you doing? You're blowing yeah. this, right? But what I'm saying is, is that I never fail to thank him. I don't think anybody is more, and I'm not trying to sit up there and say he don't deserve, you know, the credit or whatever. There is no way in my mind I would be in, sitting here today with the success that I've enjoyed if it wasn't for Allen Iverson. I mean, that guy... To, to have to be the superstar that he that he was and to embrace you in a sense where everyone, knows, I don't give a damn what report he talked to. I don't give a damn what interviews he did. I don't give a damn his availability is unavailable, inaccessible. I don't give a damn what everyone knew. Stephen A and AI mm -hmm. was special. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody knew that. Well, I, seen, I was a fly on the wall, so I was in the Sea Web trade yep. in 2003 from Sacramento to, right. to out here, and that's when I, uh, you know, I, I met I met you early on, mm -hmm. and saw the connection, and it kind of tripped me out because that's not, you know, not that you guys are the enemy, mm -hmm. but so, you know, most guys don't get that close to the right. other side, so to speak. That's right. You know what I mean? So that's early on when I started understanding and kind of following your path and understanding, man, you really know what it's like to be in our, not even knowing your backstory, but I, I, you put the time in to know what it's like to be in our shoes. Yeah. You know, and I think that's why, you know, a lot of athletes don't 
respect people that haven't done what we do because I don't, we don't think they have an appreciation and understanding how hard it is. Mm -hmm. But you put the time and work um, being a former Hooper, being right there in the mix with us to understand. So when well, your criticism comes across, it's from a good place and it's warranted. But even with you saying that, I still got to give the credit to him because he was at the top of the heat, mm -hmm. popularity-wise. And this dude had no reason to trust anybody. You understand? And certainly not me, because I'd grill him. He played like garbage tonight. He had more reason <laughs> not to trust everybody. <laughs> than trust exactly, yeah. you know what yeah. I'm saying? But, but he, I knew he fit right in my alley because what he respected most was realness. Mm -hmm. And he knew I wasn't going to lie to right. him. And so that went a long way in, in you know, the kind of things. And I never get in, and I've never told the story, and I ain't going to tell y'all what he said. But he went the hell off on Larry Brown so bad one time. Told me to turn the tape recorder on and went ballistic. <laughs> told me that. He didn't say turn it off. He said turn it on and went ballistic. And he said things about Larry Brown that would have that got him traded at the very least, okay? Because he couldn't stand Larry Brown at first, mm -hmm. right? And he came back the next day and he said, Stephen A., you write that story. It's going to kill me. It's going to kill me. <laughs> And right in front of him, I turned the tape recorder off. I said, done. I go back to the Philadelphia Inquirer. I said, kill a story. They're like, what? I said, I said, kill a story. It's not going in the paper. I promised them it's not. It's not. There'd be plenty of stories to write. We ain't writing that. Just like that. That's big. You understand? Now, I'm telling you it's the kind of story that could have made my career. Mm -hmm. Anybody else get that story? It's, it's coming and, out. And, 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 it it could have made my career. It never happened. Because... You got to touch on somebody's humanity. And again, I know what kind of man I am, mm -hmm. which is why I will go hard at certain cats. I got a problem with a few players in today's game. Make no mistake about mm -hmm. it. Because it's the chirping. It's the whispering. Yeah. And if y'all don't know, if as long as y'all have known me, I know both of y'all will vouch for this. Kobe can vouch for this. D-Wade can vouch for this. CP can vouch for this. Mellow, others. There's a lot of people that can vouch for this. All you got to do is come talk to me. That's it. You That's don't, it. I don't have to agree with you. I don't have to. You, we could cuss each other out. You know, it doesn't matter. But we can talk as men. What I don't have any respect for is the chirping. Sneak this. It's, it's, it's all that stuff. And, and, and when we talk about my history, my career, you know who two or three of the players that I was most tight with throughout my reporting career? Derek Coleman. Mm. Oh. Rahar Strickland. Oh. And Oak. I knew it. <laughs> I knew oh. it. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody fuck with, with Oak, man. Fight with a lot of cats. But the, let me, you know why? Because they never lied to me. You two yeah. never lied to me. If you couldn't say something, you didn't say something. Yeah. Or you say, Stephen A., I ain't touching that. You know what I'm Because you knew I understood. No, Stephen, I ain't going there. Yeah. And that's all I'm talking about. It's like, do you know what, what I would have to deal with if I wrote something about Oak? Without talking to Oak, yeah. you know, or yeah. DC, Trust or, me, or, I know. or somebody like that. Oh hell no, I don't want that problem. Right. I don't want that problem. Nobody oh, no, no, no. Do. Oak, I need to talk to you. <laughs> Where you at? Because what I'm saying, he's he's a man. Right. And it's like you're gonna deal with him on the real. MJ, another cat, real. You know, stuff like that. I don't have any tolerance or any patience for the chirping. It's weak, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and so a lot of times you got these cats, you got your Twitter account, you got Facebook, you got all of this other stuff. Okay, that's fine. Well, I do have seven million social media followers. Um, I do have a two-hour daily national television show. I do have a nationally syndicated radio show. Um, I am getting paid a little bit. I'm not broke. You're going to get so, your give back. You know I mean, we really want to go here? <laughs> we really want to go here? Or can we talk? Like men. Just a conversation. Just a conversation. And because I think one of the things that I've proven in my career, if I'm wrong, I'll say I'm wrong. And oh, That's by the way, do. if I say something publicly wrong, mm -hmm. I'm not going to apologize privately. I'll go right on yeah. national television. Yo, he got me. I was wrong. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. You, you don't have to be the way these cats are. And I'm not saying all, I'm not saying most, but there's a few of them that's just weak oh. when it comes to just communicating as men. Mm -hmm. And I don't respect that. I don't respect that at all because I'm not that way. Right. I don't and either. I don't expect them to be that way. I don't either. 
I most just of the time because I, I, mean, I think they're weak and, and timid because they know what, what was being said is real. So you could Probably. be mad about it, Probably. But, but the truth hurts. But not just that. Here's where I don't have respect. You could come to me and it could be real. I never forget when AI was mad at me and we didn't talk for almost two years and Cats was sitting up there saying, yo, man, AI can't wait to see you, man. He going he gonna to do something to you. They were talking, <laughs> they were talking like that. Right. You could ask AI this. And, and I rolled down to Atlanta. I made a special trip. I went down with Atlanta. I had my boys. I rolled up there. I told ESPN about like, look, I got to handle this. I need y'all. I got to handle this. This is a man thing. Y'all don't understand. I got to handle this. So I walked out. I went down there. AI came there. He met up with me. And he humbled me in a way that I've never been humbled in my career. Because he said, you were right. You weren't wrong. He said, it's just that I saw your name in the headline. Mm -hmm. He said, your name on the byline. Mm -hmm. And that hurt me. Mm -hmm. And I said, damn. You know, because oh, I'm yeah. sitting there, I'm like, I'm doing my job. Right, right. And I'm looking out. And this shit I didn't say. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot that I right. could have said, but I didn't say it. And I wouldn't say it. But it still hurt me because it was like, he's right. Right. I mean, I had to do my job because, you know, you missing in action. So the people, Sixers people playing. People better realize like, you got a job to do. I got now. a job to do. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is all he was saying, he wasn't saying that I shouldn't have written it. Mm -hmm. He was explaining where his hurt came from. Mm -hmm. In other words, the same exact story, word for word, verbatim, could have been written. And if it was somebody else's name yeah, on the byline, he them. wouldn't have cared. Right. It yeah. was that it was me. Right. Yeah. And, it re and it just reminded me, yo, man, our relationship is not typical. Mm -hmm. We got a special relationship. You mean a lot to us, man. Man. Whether, yeah. whether you know it a lot, you mean yeah. a lot to us, man. Yeah, shit. And so, and so for me, I, I just, what I try to do is, that's why I go out of my way. I'm like, look, I'm going to look for you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to come talk to you. Mm -hmm. Yo, keep doing this, and I'm going to have to do this. Right. Stop. Fix this. Whatever, whatever. Do this. You know, this is your personal stuff. You ain't got to worry about that. I ain't got nothing to say about that. But I'm going to say this about you on the court. Right. I'm going to say this about, you know, you coming to practice later. I'm mm -hmm. going to do something like that. And so when you have that kind of mentality, you just wish that people saw you. as Like, I'm just looking at that them like, yo, do you, have you seen what I've been doing? I don't have to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I get paid to talk about you, mm -hmm. not to you. Right. I go out of my way to travel, go to games, and do all of this stuff to talk to you. I don't have to do that. There is nothing in my contract obligating me to talk to y'all mm -hmm. at all. Right. I can simply watch the games and give my opinion. But I travel across this country talking to you, trying to cultivate a relationship with you just so you know, yo, man, you got something to say about me. I, I got something to say in response. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here talking to y'all today. There is no excuse on God's green earth why I should go on the air and talk about Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson without calling you. What possible excuse could With I have? The relationship we have, for sure. What possible? I mean, to, if something happened, I need to first say, yo, I haven't spoken to them. Right. I'm going to speak to them. This is as much as I can say until I speak to them. Mm -hmm. And there's certain players in the league to this very day that are like that. I don't. Tr I try not to say a damn word about them until I talk to them, mm -hmm. because some of them scared to live in hell. Like you, you go like this. Oh damn! I'm going here now. <laughs> oh shit! They calling me now. This Sensitive. Is, that's right. But yeah. but but again, in the right way from the standpoint, they pick up the phone and call you. I right. respect that. Mm -hmm. You know, you got some cats that their hanger ons call you, their agents call you, yeah, and yeah. all that other stuff. Like for example, whether it was D Wade, it was a CP3, it was especially Kobe or somebody. No man. I see their name, I'm like, damn, yeah. uh -oh. I done messed up. <laughs> what did I do? What's going on real quick? Right. <laughs> what did I but do? That's a respect that's thing, too. There we go. And I know that. Yeah. And I know that. And that's what I respect. Mm -hmm. There's too many cats that chirp and whisper and use hanger ons to do it. And that's what pisses me off. We know them. We know I them. You know, I know, I know you know them. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, and they know we know them. You know and they know them. we know them. Yeah. And they know we know because there's no excuse for it. Right. It really, really isn't. It really isn't. We live in a climate today that's really touchy. Like you said, we don't like to bring race into it, but race plays sure. a big key in just to today's society. Yeah. When, you, when your hot takes or your point of views go against culture, so to speak, and, and I've seen it of late, and, yep. and Jack and I talked Especially about it off camera, it, yeah. right. Tell me what it's like when they try to question your blackness or, 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 or what you stand for, just because you don't agree with well, quote unquote all, culture. First of all, that <laughs> pisses me off. It that's, that's one of the that's one of the few things that pisses me off. I usually have alligator skin. I know it don't seem that way because I'm ranting and raving on the airwaves, 
but I sleep well at night. You know what I'm saying? I'm not worried mm -hmm. about most things. People say, I don't give a damn. I'm going to do what I do. Yes, sir. But when they question my blackness, first of all, there's a couple of several layers where you find that offensive. First of all, do you know who I am? Do you know what battles that I have fought in corporate America to facilitate opportunities for black people? Ask ESPN, ask the Philadelphia Inquirer, ask the New York Daily News, ask Fox, ask young brothers and sisters in this industry the things that I have done to pave the way and pave the road for them. Those folks don't know what they're talking about. That's number one. Number two, who the hell are you to define blackness? What is the definition of blackness? Because, see, we got to be careful with stuff like that. Like, you know, you got folks that sit up there. I'm not a Republican, but you got folks that sit up there, and the second they see a black Republican, they say he's a sellout. Well, was, was Colin Powell a sellout? Mm. Serving in our military? Serving, serving this country? Was he a sellout? Mm. Really? Are you sure about that? Did you know that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had Republican ideals? Did you know that? Do you listen to folks like Minister Farrakhan and others preaching about the same things that actual conservatives preach about in terms of handling your own business, being an entrepreneur, owning your own stuff, not dependent on the government or anybody else to do things for you that you could potentially do for yourself? Do you know? And what is your definition of blackness? And then the third element to it that really, really alarms me is what's your incentive for doing that? Now let's sit what here. Get out we of it. we right. sitting here. We talk. Let's be real. Ain't nobody running from it. Mm -hmm. This whole Kaepernick stuff that went down. Mm -hmm. So let's analyze this for a second. Colin Kaepernick takes a knee. It was for police brutality. It was for racial discrimination and racial inequality. As I said on first take, what black man would possibly have a problem with that? Of course, I didn't have a problem with right. that. Where I took issue was your execution after you knee. You took a knee because now it's about where you're going from here. So he, Eric Reed, and others, you going after black folks. First, it was Malcolm Jenkins, a brother, plays for the Philadelphia Eagles, won a Super Bowl championship with the New Orleans Saints. He sits up there. He's talking with you, trying to include you into the mix because they're negotiating with owners to address the issues you said you wanted to address. You didn't say anything about you wanting a job. You didn't say, you said police brutality, racial discrimination, okay, racial oppression. You wanted those issues addressed. What did they do? The league itself negotiates an $89 million payout to the Players Coalition. You didn't want to be a part of that. That's why you weren't a part of it. Eric Reed accused them of co-opting the movement. We understand that. I don't agree with it, but we understand it. What Malcolm Jenkins is saying is, you took a knee. Now what are you going to do? You said you wanted the issues addressed. We trying to get the issues addressed. It could be more for billionaires, but 89 million is 89 million dollars. Right. It's better than zero, right. right? You have a problem with it, I get it. You, Eric Reed, you approached this brother at midfield during the coin toss of a game on a Sunday afternoon. You ready to fight this brother. You get ready to go on the football field against him. But instead, you want to go street on the football field because you don't like what he did. Jay-Z, music mogul, everybody loves Jay-Z, mad respect, from the hood, talks about it, preaches about it, uplifts people, hires brothers and sisters, mind you. You understand what I'm saying? Been doing great things throughout his life while building his own empire. He, stand, he sits before Roger Goodell. They announce this deal. They announce the deal. His words weren't the greatest when he sat up there and said, you know what, we were beyond kneeling. But people forget that 10 seconds earlier, he said, I have no problem with anybody kneeling. You can do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, where do we go from here? Why? Because he's plotting. I got 31 billionaires to deal with. 32, actually. Okay? 32 billionaires to deal with. I might get an ownership stake in this. <laughs> I might be the first brother to ever own an NFL team, which at that time I'm going to position myself to be for the league to be more inclusionary so all of us could get so a lot of us could get paid. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I'm not gonna hoot and holler, but behind the scenes, I'm gonna work to get Colin Kaepernick this tryout. Mm -hmm. Right? Eric Reed comes out, calls him despicable. Mm -hmm. Right? Colin Kaepernick says nothing, right? Ray Lewis, 
Hall of Fame linebacker, played for the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. He's behind the scenes, owner Steve Bashotti for the Baltimore Ravens, a billionaire, is thinking about bringing, this is before Lamar Jackson, mind you. Mm -hmm. He's thinking about bringing him on board, right? Just chill, just chill. What happens? Colin Kaepernick's lady at the time compares mm -hmm. J, um, Ray Lewis and Steve Bashotti to the characters in Django played by Samuel L. Jackson and Leonardo the, DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah. Squashes that opportunity, right? Now we fast forward to a few weeks ago. Why is Stephen A. on the air so pissed off? Because when I was in the process of generating $4 million in scholarship, for underprivileged kids at historically black colleges and universities, where I had that event at the University of Delaware State that Magic Johnson and Troy Benson and them showed up to, mm -hmm. right? We raised $4 million in scholarships. 470 plus kids got scholarships because of that one day event, right? While I'm promoting that, I go to a radio station to do an interview. I've never seen Colin Kaepernick's lady in my life. I've never spoken to her or anything like that. She has somebody come out there. They're incredibly respectful and classy. They tell me what their dismay is over. They felt like I got a few things wrong. I firmly disagree with that, but that's neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. I sit up there, and I look her dead in the face, and I said, okay, here's my number. This is my number. I promise you from this day forward, I will never utter a word about you or Colin Kaepernick that you don't put right there on my phone. I will read from the damn thing if I have to. You never have to worry about that again. You have my word. We cool. She doesn't stop there. What she says is, Colin Kaepernick deserves this. He took the, made this sacrifice for us. He deserves the opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. Will you help us? Fine. So who's behind the scenes? It wasn't just Jay-Z and a host of other people. It was also me mm -hmm. and a slew of other reporters who were remain nameless that were behind the scenes trying to get this guy the workout because you all were saying nobody called. Mm -hmm. So we were doing this. So yes, when the NBA proposed it, it was shake, the NFL, I'm sorry, it was kind of shaky. Yeah. We understand that, you know, they could have done it better. They could have gave you more notice. They could have gave you more time to prepare. They could have done a lot of things that was my, That was my major gripe with, with the transparency factor. And to me, the NFL has proven they can't be trusted in, a certain, in several different well, occasions. Well, let me interject. Here's why that argument falls on deaf ears. Because you knew that when you wanted the job. Now, if we all sit here talking amongst ourselves and we cool, we brothers, right? And all of a sudden, I give you a reason to not trust me. That's entirely different. Not only do you not trust them, you sued them. You filed a grievance against them. You settled. You settled. Who settled? Who files a grievance against a company, settles, and then still says, I want a job with you? So, of course, you didn't trust them. We understood this. So, my point is, is that with all of that going on, right, I'm sitting there going like this, okay. You said no one called you. I happen to know that Jay-Z and Rock Nation was leading the call behind the scenes, working with the NFL. The owners, the half the owners didn't want to do it. They literally said, bump them. We made 10 million in revenue already, okay? You know how much money, I mean, a couple, a year or more than a year ago, we got 226 million a piece for our television deal alone. We got the ratings back. Folks are walking through the turnstiles. We good. And not only that, we got four top league MVP candidates and all of them are black quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. We don't need him. We ain't have to do this. And I was told, Jay-Z was like, oh, hell no, yes, you do. Nah, I can't do this. We ain't going out like that. Mm -hmm. I need you mm -hmm. to make sure this you happens. give this brother an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? Everybody, if you notice, go back and look at the tape, the first tape. Got my social media guy right there. He's got my evidence. You got people there. Three, four teams going to show up. I was the one that went on the air. Minimum 24 showing up. How I get that information? Mm. Why would I say that? Right. Think about that. Yeah. Everybody else said two or three. Mm -hmm. I went on the air and said 24. Does that not give you an indication that I'm kind of plugged into this? Right. And so I'm like, look, y'all, it's, it's, it's being done. And then not only that, I got a call three days before the workout. 
after being told by various coaches and what have you, usually when a free agent has a workout with the team, they don't have more than 24 hours. Mm. So y'all talk about five days like it's a small window. We usually only give them one day. Because if they ready, they ready. They ready if they right. not, they not. Mm -hmm. And everybody was talking about, oh, next year, next year. No, they wanted to work out because they were going to give them a job. I was literally told. Now, whether it's true or not, guys, we'll never know, and I don't know. You know that. But I'm telling you what I was told. Quote, Colin Kaepernick will have to throw the football into the stands to not have a job in mm -hmm. two weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two mm -hmm. weeks. I went on the air and said so. I texted his camp and said so. I was completely ignored. Completely ignored. Suddenly, no return text. Nobody got anything to say. And I'm saying, yo, this is what's going down. He about to get a job in the National Football League. 24 teams showing up. So all of a sudden, you hear this wave of stuff. And, all, and I'm not decrying any of that. I'm not, I'm not questioning it. What I'm saying is, you can't tell me a condition you faced in that scenario that you're surprised by. Because of your already your evident lack of trust for them. Right. But they also have a lack of trust for you. Because they're fearful that if a team themselves on their own calls you up, but you don't, they don't believe you're good enough to make the team, you're going to accuse them of something that's going to have them by themselves in the lead, in the mix, in the eye of the storm media-wise. So they wanted to use the NFL as cover. Roger Goodell got uh, Roger Goodell and the NFL agreed to provide that cover and said they'll call us so the heat wouldn't be on the individual teams. And not only did 26 different teams show up, not 24, 26, not only did they show up, but you know what else happened? Most of them were black. Black officials in the pipeline to be pro personnel guys, GMs, et cetera, et cetera, because their whole thing is, like most black folks, we agree with Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. We appreciate right. the, the, the kneeling and the protesting. And those brothers were sent by the owners, and the owners like, you make that call. They were coming to town. So my point is, when you heard me on the air going off, that's why I was going off. And I'm explaining all of this, and all anybody sees is, I don't agree with Cap. Right. Or Eric Reed, and he ain't a real brother. He's like, you know, Uncle Tom and all of this other stuff. And I'm like, really? This is the same dude that's on national television all the time, putting my behind on the line, addressing issues that we need to address? You really, really think it's an accident that whether it was Max Kellerman or Skip Bayless or anybody before him or anybody that you see on the air, you think it's an accident these topics come up on first take? Mm -hmm. Let me ask y'all a question. Everybody's been reading about my contract. Everybody's been reading about I'm being the face of ESPN. Do you think these issues will come up on first take as often as they do if I did not say okay? <laughs> right. It comes up because I allow it to come mm -hmm. up. If I said no, don't touch right. it, it ain't coming up. Yeah, we know how production works. So <laughs> my, <laughs> you're damn right you do. <laughs> so I'm sitting there like, what do you think is going on here? Right. Do you think, you know, with Max and his, his racially conscious self and being invited <laughs> to the barbecues, which I appreciate. <laughs> here's, 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 here's the deal. Here's the deal. You don't think I know he's going to receive that kind of reception? You think I don't know that? You know, I know Max background. I, I, I know what time it is. I know he's going to receive that kind of reception. I know that it's best coming from him in certain situations mm -hmm. rather than the angry black dude who's disgusted mm -hmm. at the man mm -hmm. continuously trying to keep us down. No, hear from him. So I'm like, but you see people from our community and it's like, you, you don't see this? They don't get it. I mean, when you, when you think about you know, you think about Selma, you think about Montgomery, you think about, from an historical perspective, the things that black folks went through in order for us to get to this level, the thing that black folks went through in order to get to this level. Tell me when it's, it was a success, when there wasn't a plan. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, always a plan. Mm -hmm. Because if you just do something haphazard, People are going to say it's haphazard and they're not going to take it seriously. How do you not know that? How do you not get that? So that's where the questioning of my blackness comes because I got news for you. I don't give a damn how much money they want to report that I'm making in the news. And by the way, they're wrong about it. Let me tell you something right now. <laughs> I'd make a whole hell of a lot more money if I was the sellout that some people tried to describe me. Thanks. Thanks. And that is a fact. Thanks. I believe it.
It's deep. And, and that's the one thing, like I said, I, I, I referenced this a few times. People know the on-air personality of who you are, just like they knew who they thought Jack and I were. And we were able to, you know, utilize our platform and kind of speak on it. And that's what I kind of wanted to do today with you was just allow people to see the other side because people to get a, you know, a show, a, a, you know, a look at a show and think, oh, I know what Stephen A is all about. And, and that kind of stuff at first used to bother me. But I just had to understand that people don't know, that don't know me, it doesn't really matter what they think about me. But at the same time, it's tough because the, the people that do know you understand where you come from. We may not always agree yeah. with what you're saying, but you know, Jack has a great quote, you know, we can disagree, but still have respect for each other. That's right. And I think too often today, it, it's all the way or nothing. Well, the thing <clears throat> about it is the operative word there is all. Like for example, <clears throat> you see me on TV, that's me. That's a part of me. Mm -hmm. It's not all of me, mm -hmm. you know? And who shows the entire arsenal? We don't have to. Right. You call what the moment calls for. You show what the moment calls for. Right. You know, when we look at you sitting here talking, is that the Matt Barnes we saw on the court? One of the Matt Barnes I saw on the court. Nobody. That's not you. <laughs> That's not you. I'm trying to tell you right now. You're far mm -hmm. more mild mannered now <laughs> and, and, and off the court, always in the locker room than you were on the court. Yeah. But you see that see people see you. They see your tats. They look mm -hmm. at that. They listen to they watch you on the court and they think that you ignorant and then they go into a locker room and they are blown away by your level of intellect. This brother Steve always been real, real, real as a heart attack. You could, there was no excuse to talk about Steven Jackson without talking to him. Cause he would talk I'm to you. I'm gonna give it to you. He would give it to you. It's like, <laughs> what possible, it's like, I have nothing to say. I mean, what, what am I gonna say to this brother? All I gotta do is go up to him and ask him. Yep. If I say, yo Steve, man, I'm about to say this on the air. You got something to say, hell yeah, I got something to say. Mm -hmm. And he'd say it. Right. So guess what? You take the power away from me to just editorialize and just say what I want to say. Nah, not if I'm a decent, respectable professional, because as a decent, respectable professional, I have an inherent obligation to make sure your voice is just as profound about mine, mm -hmm. if not right. more so when it comes to you. Mm -hmm. You see, if you speak, then I got nothing to say. And when you see me, get, listen, man, I told you before, I had a situation and, 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 and John Wall's a good guy and he and I will eventually talk one day or whatever. But last year we had this issue. He was upset because I mentioned a nightclub that he was at, all right, in, in DC. Mm -hmm. Fellas, I don't do that. TMZ did it. They that had, man right had, there. They'll do anything. That man right there came to me and showed me the video. <laughs> of him at the club. Yeah. And so I said, you can't be there 36 hours before the game when people are already questioning that you in shape. Can't do it. Yeah. That's all I said. That's all I said. And so all of a sudden I'm going from city to city and I'm catching cats and you you know, he, he like you dimed him out. I did no such thing. Because if TMZ hadn't reported it, I'd have never mentioned it. I'd have just said, you better be ready. Mm -hmm. You better play. I wouldn't have said anything about the club, right. but shit, since you on the club's being seen on video, right. you know, catch out the bag. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is I go to D.C. to see him. Brother in the training room won't come out. I'm standing at his locker because they said he had a problem with me. I flew to D.C. from New York at a moment's notice. Only a 45-minute flight, but damn it, I ain't, I'm busy. I still did it. <laughs> I flew to D.C., stood in front of the locker. The brother wouldn't come out. And then a week later, and said, I just wish somebody would be man enough to say what they got to say to my face. I got, I, got a plane <laughs> ticket. I got a plane ticket that I paid for that shows, you know, I did come to say, you know, whatever it is. Face -face. What I'm saying is there's numerous cats, including you two. I would never have to do that too. Mm -hmm. Not in a million years. If nothing else, y'all be, oh, I'm coming out. I'm coming outside. We, yo, Stephen A, let me do we this interview with it. the media. We gonna have this conversation when we fit. Done. Mm -hmm. But you just see all of this stuff. You got cats, like, they looking at you like they, 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 they want to do something to you. I'm a grown man. And I'm not about First. 52. I'm, I'm, that's right. I'm 52 years old. I'm not trying to get into no fight or nothing like that, but... I am from Hollis, Queens. Yeah. You really, really think you just going to do something to me? <laughs> <laughs> and nothing's going to happen to you? Yeah, damn right. Like, really? So, you know, I'm, again, I'm not talking, I'm not trying to be violent. Nah, I'm, that, 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 that ain't me. That. I'm, not, I'm not saying that. Respect it's goes like, both ways, and, and, though. It's like, exactly. Respect comes both ways. Now, 
we can, you know, I'm not going to do that. But you really, really think I, I have no friends. I just I'm just left out alone. By the way, I, I make a lot of money for ESPN. You just think they just going to let something. <laughs> I mean, you you really, really think that when I walk the streets alone, I'm really alone. Right. You know, just like you just listen to people sometimes like really, Nothing you really think it's like this. you just don't you just going to do something. Right. And it's like and then you just you, you're saying all of that to say for what, guys, mm -hmm. if you have a problem. You come to me. If I'm wrong, I will admit it, I will apologize, and I will correct the record. Right. If I'm right, I'm standing my ground. But even as I stand my ground, I still might let it go. And just be like, nah, this ain't worth that it. Ain't worth et cetera, et cetera. I ran up to um, y'all seen me before. I had beef with Big Dog Robinson in the years past. Man, I ran up to his son, his son that Golden State was playing in Houston. I saw his son. The first thing I said to his son, I walked up to him and I said, yo, man, you see me beefing with your dad, whatever. Let me tell you two things. Number one, I was wrong. Number two, I said it'll never happen again. Now, I didn't specify. It wasn't that I was wrong about what I felt at the time or anything like that. I was wrong for allowing it to get to the level that it was, that it got to, because we both grown men. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's your son and he's in the league. And I don't want that young man running around thinking that you know what, me and your father had beef, so guess what, you yeah, gotta yeah. be, no, work I'm not that dude. You right. see what I'm saying? And not only that, I want, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a man who's a father and I'm a proud black man and I want you, not to say that I had any reason to question it, but I want you to continue to love your father and to look at him for the good man that he is. Just because we might have had a beef mm -hmm. don't mean that he's a bad guy. Right. And I told him when I see your father, I'm going to apologize to him and shake his hand because I don't want that kid running around trying to elevate himself in this league and thinking that, you know, you got to worry about somebody like me and what I'm going to say mm -hmm. because of some, some nonsensical beef with your dad. There ain't no beef. Right. Ain't no beef. Big Dog and I had a disagreement, but I'm sure he's a good brother. I know a lot of people that say he's a good brother. And when I see the man, I'm going to apologize to him because I don't want his son in this league thinking something like that. That's just the human side, right. man. You got to... You know, you see a lot of these cats, man, and it's really a damn shame that they've gotten away from manhood and simply having a discussion and squashing stuff. It's really sad that cats it's can't different do day. That. And it, it's different. And I, I, I put you, I put you up there with Stuart Scott, you know, with Michael Wilbon, the guys that paved the way for us. Mm -hmm. And me and Matt talked about on the show. We wanted, we really wanted you to come on the show, not to talk about a lot of stuff. We wanted to give you your props too, give you your flowers too, because it, you paved the way for us. And a lot of people see the things you say and automatically disagree, but they don't understand that you're not one, you're doing the job, but this is your real feelings. Right. This is your real feelings. This is how you feel. And when people get outside their feelings and understand that this is coming from a genuine place, you're not just saying stuff for a check or you're not just saying stuff just to, just to piss somebody off. This is your life. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? When people understand that, then they can see a different you. And we've been seeing that. Right. But that's one reason why we wanted you on the show, to give you a flowers because we understand. I appreciate it. You know it. what I'm definitely. saying? We definitely understand. Well, I definitely, man, listen, I got love for both of y'all, man. I've loved y'all for a long time. Y'all good brothers, man, and y'all real as hell. And that's what I respect the most, man. If, if they, they, Not that we've ever had any issue. He and I had a disagreement about weed on social issues. But men's some, supposed to for, disagree. I'm just saying, for some reason, I, I mean, people are acting like that's going to be a problem. I was like, what did he say? Right. I, I, said, I looked at the video, I'm like, I don't understand what he said that I'm supposed to be offended by. I said, that's, that's my what they man. Wanted, though, I said, I said y'all, like, y'all, and that's why I immediately went. I said, y'all are not getting that. That's my mm. man. We yes. disagree. And damn it, he was right. He said, I said, he said I was ignorant. You're damn right, I was ignorant. Speaking so, of weed, sure. staying off the sure, weed. Sure, I mean, that's sure. a it, that's yeah. a hot topic right now. Yeah. I think as someone who's used it since I was 14, mm -hmm. Jack is, you know, just as long. Mm -hmm. It's something that we really feel navigated us through our career mm -hmm. um, and, and really helped us on and off the court, mm -hmm. um, knowing what the consequences were at times if we got caught. But it, to, to me, it didn't, it, they, they still weren't enough for me to not continue to use it. You've okay. taken a very strong stance, and I understand what your stance is. You, I'll let you explain it, but from my understanding, is don't do it if it's gonna fuck your money up. Yeah. So get, go simple. in on go in on what you. But it, but 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 I'm glad you said. But it's really that simple. To me. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's never been. It about, I, 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 once again, I have to go back to my roots without telling family friend business. Right. I'm from Hollis, Queens. Yeah. 
You really, really think that I have an issue with people smoking weed? I mean, I've known it and been surrounded by it all my life. Mm -hmm. It's not an issue. Mm -hmm. It's an issue when you let it affect your money. That is my issue. I have never, get, now me personally, I've never wanted to do it. The reason why is this. My mentality is this. Anything that inebriates me in any way potentially empowers somebody else, which is why I leaned on your statement when you said about my ignorance about it, because I'm like, I'm glad you said that because I am. I don't pretend to know. <laughs> I, don't I know never pretended it. to. How the, hell, how the hell do I know? What I'm saying to you is this. I have been, I have covered an NBA game in the past where a dude was wobbling back and forth and literally couldn't take instructions from Larry Brown because he was high. And that was not Allen Iverson. Okay, let me be very, very clear. That happened right in front of my face. But I also saw cats that, you know, you could smell it, you could see it, you know, the whole bit. And it didn't affect them. Mm -hmm. Hell, some of them played better with it. Yeah. So I got it. Facts. My flip side to it is that there's a reason I had to bring Snoop Dogg on my show. Mm -hmm. Because Snoop Dogg had to articulate my, like, I think I have a strong, you know, command of the English language. There I think go. I speak fluent English. And I'm like, I don't understand why the hell people can't understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I am not saying you shouldn't do it because you shouldn't do it. I'm saying... If you work in a league where they're telling you it's going to affect your money, right. as hard as you work to get that money, why give it away for that? Right. Now, if you wasn't giving it away from that, I'm good with it. If you sat up there and went like this, look, man, I make $10 million. If I do this, it might cost me five hundred thousand. Stephen A. I can afford it. <laughs> well, I got nothing to say. I got nothing. It's like okay, okay, this makes sense. But yeah. when you are literally whining and crying about how the league should change their policy, as some players have done, while you in the game, while you in the game, yeah. just because you can't get your way. All right, I usually equate, and I'll bring children into that equation for for, for an example. All of us are fathers here. Mm -hmm. Just imagine for a second. Well, Daddy, I need you to change this rule because I don't like it. It doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? It don't work like who, that. Who do you think you are? You have the right to do what the hell you told. Mm -hmm. Period. This is not a democracy. Mm -hmm. I don't give a damn what Oprah tells you. It ain't a democracy. Okay, not in this house. Mm -hmm. You're going to do what you're supposed to do because you are the child and I am the adult. Well, essentially, that's what a league is saying to you mm -hmm. in a roundabout way. Not to disrespect you, but there's a power structure. You volunteered to play. You wasn't drafted. This is what you chose. Well, you knew the rules when you signed the contract. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and so if you know the rules, understand, you're going to be held accountable for it. I'm just of the mindset, as I said earlier, I'm not just a black man. I'm a brother. I don't have anything against anybody. But I love my brothers, man. And my attitude is if I see you doing anything that I think is detrimental to you, I'm going to let you know. Mm -hmm. And if I know you personally, then it's going to be personal. Mm -hmm. And meaning I'm going to approach you personally. If I don't know you, but I have this platform, then I'm going to use the platform to send that message if you find yourself in the news. What I will never do is dime you out. Mm -hmm. I'll never tell on you and cost you your money. Right. But if you allow yourself to get caught in you in the public You're eye, speak on it. now I'm going to speak on it. If I saw you, it could be anything. It's weed, it could be anything. If you, you've had other issues that you've had to deal with, you too. Mm -hmm. we, you then Stephen A come up to you? Yo, man, come in. Oh, yeah. Go right to y'all. Especially, yeah, so, especially after doing? that bra. That's right. Yeah. What, 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 I said, you see what you doing? Well. What, you, what are you doing? No, 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 no. Say this, do this, do that, mm -hmm. because we need you back in the league, getting your Leave money, doing what you got to do. Yep. Period. Mm -hmm. And I would want y'all to do the same for me. Right. My whole argument in the stance that, you know, understanding that I, we really really just feel now being former athletes that we can kind of be the shield for it. And I'm working with UCLA on a cannabis research program, but, but to me, they're pumping us full of opioids to get us back on that field. I mean, we're, we're, we're possessions to them and we understand it's, it, it's a process and whatever it is. And, you know, we're high paid a commodity for them, but they're causing, so they'll pump you full of anything, shoot you full of Toradol, have you on all kinds of prescription drugs that are masking one thing, causing a long-term effect uh, mm -hmm. on the other hand, but then want to penalize you for cannabis. Uh, you know, I was in the drug program towards the end of my career mm -hmm. and got close with a couple guys that were running it. And they told me, you know, over 200 guys are in here just for that alone. You know Well, what I mean? let me respond to that. <clears throat> That's a very smart, cogent argument 
cannot be disputed. Here's your problem. That's their rules. Their rules. Now, their rules that you agreed to abide by. Right. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, if we put if we if we put our big boy pants on and we address the stuff the way that it needs to be addressed, you can make that argument. Hell, take it all the way up to Capitol Hill for crying out loud. There are ways to do it, but. It's a slow, grueling, process, right. tedious Run. process that nobody wants to go through. Al going to through it. To mm -hmm. Totally, totally, totally understand. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. It's still their rules. And it's their money you want. So at some point in time, while you're making the argument, knowing that they're wrong, once again, we could even go and switch the subject and we could go back to Kaepernick or anybody else. Sure, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. What black man you know? has been in a working environment where we felt the rules were totally fair. Just tell me who that is. Because I never met him. Right. I've never met him. Right. I have never met him. Guess what? I don't know white people who felt all the rules were fair to them. Right. It's the world we live in. And at some point in time, what is measured is your level of discipline in the face of adversity. Because that's what separates the men from the boys. For example, Y'all are doing this podcast. Two intelligent brothers that are real. You know, you're going to cut through the chase. You're going to get the stuff. All of this stuff is true. But you didn't put a camera here and here None and there that. and just sit here. You got a crew of people e, around G, you. Sean, right. So why are these people working with you? Because they have faith in you. And to make us better. Not just to make you better, but they have faith in you. They have faith in your ability to perform and that you're going to exercise the discipline that it takes to reach new heights. Mm -hmm. Let, we can sit up there and talk about first take number one, man. They did some rating. They said to me, Stephen A is the number one talent in sports media. All right, fine. Here's why I'm really getting paid. I'm trustworthy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show up to work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to try to let them down. Professional. I'm not going to be somebody that says, bump y'all. I got my money. I do what I want, when I want, how I want. Because remember, my dollars are guaranteed too. Mm -hmm. Ain't no wiggle room out of my stuff other than the morals clause like anybody else has. Oh, my numbers are guaranteed, dog. Next, next, say it if it's true. Mm -hmm. You understand? My numbers are guaranteed. Mm -hmm. You don't get that without trust. Right. They said we trust you to do that. So for me to do anything that deviates from that is an indictment against me yeah. because now I've shown I'm not trustworthy. Right. And that word is going to spread and circulate. And then people are going to be reluctant to do business with me because I'm not trustworthy. It's like, how do you not see that, particularly as black people, knowing what disadvantages we're operating under? Right. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, y'all asked me to come here and do an interview with y'all. Y'all were waiting for me. I wasn't waiting for y'all because this is y'all show. So guess who was here waiting? Now, imagine what it would have been like if I got here before y'all. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, it's like... Just, just use your logic and understand this is the world that we're living in. And when you talk business with people, it's not just about your ability. It's about your ability to be trusted. And that's what you have to have. And this, to me, whether it's weed or anything else, is just the latest increment or the latest example, the latest obstacle that's in your path testing whether or not you can be trusted to handle your business in spite of the circumstances being less than ideal for you. Mm -hmm. and, you know, a, a lot of players don't understand when they fail drug tests or when they get caught in the streets, they hurting the cars, all the work Al's doing. You know, you said it was a slow grind. It is a slow grind, but we getting there. Right. He got David Stern to say we should be legal. That's right. He got, so it's a slow grind, but when guys fail drug tests or get caught, they are, they don't stand, they hurting the cause and it's gonna be longer and longer before it's legal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all little things. It's all little things. Like for example, you know, usually I'm suited and booted. You know, y'all can dress like that, y'all could do that. I can't all the time. Right. Because of the platform that I have available to me and the people who are watching on a come up, y'all have earned the right to sit here exactly how y'all are. Do you remember this though? The first sure. time I did ESPN. That's right. I saw you, the, I did one show, and the second time I seen you, say, put a suit on. Put a suit on. Put a exactly suit on. what I told him. And I put the suit on. I had a four-year career with ESPN. That's right. I remember that like And yesterday. by the way, it's not finished. It's not finished. It's not finished. It's not I'm not coming it. for you. The point that I'm trying to make to you, the point that I'm trying to make is that I didn't tell him to put a suit on because I like a suit. 
I said, they view you yeah. in such a way. Yeah. They view you in such a way. So when I'm talking to y'all, I'm saying, look, man, I got mine, but it ain't no fun being successful by yourself. Yeah. Well, you want to right, reach back. I, I mean, I talk to a whole bunch of cats trying to reach back and help the best way I possibly can because I want them to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when I'm talking to athletes and whatever and I'm getting on them and you see me going off, if you notice, I'm looking pissed because I want you to succeed. Yeah, I'm not yeah. happy that you're struggling. Right, I'm not right. happy that you're failing. I'm like, wait a minute. Do what you're supposed to do. Then venture out. Mm -hmm. As Denzel once said to me, do what you have to do. So you can do what, yeah, what you, you want to do. do. Yeah. That's what it's all about. And that's, the, and that's the kind of message that I think we all should be preaching collectively. Before we get out of here, sure. growing up in Queens, uh, all the ups and downs, Hooper, finding your way, finding your voice, finding who you are. Did you ever think you'd be on the brink of being the highest paid sports personality ever? No, I never thought that. Um, it's an incredible honor. I don't talk about my money, but I will say I've been taken care of. That's right. Thoroughly. Did you get, you got the contract? Um, pretty much here. I mean, I still got to sign it, but we've agreed. We've agreed. We've, agreed. we've yes. reached a verbal agreement. Yes, sir. Um, that's why you've seen the news. And I'm incredibly grateful. Um, I know I worked my butt off. I know I've earned it. Mm -hmm. But they still didn't have to give it. Right. right. You know, and so, you know, for me, you got a lot of people who get paid and to them, they've arrived. My attitude is I've gotten paid. Now let me show you why yeah, I deserve really to get paid, mm -hmm. right? what I got paid. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, it does elevate some things in your life. And it's not just your quality of life. It's the quality of the impact you're capable of having on people. Because when you read about me and you hear about what I'm doing or what I've achieved, who's not going to listen to what I have to right. say? It, it still motivates us, it. though. Yeah, it, mot it, 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 it motivates us. It motivates, it motivates everybody. And so for me... I look at it, I never saw it coming, not to this degree. Um, I'm incredibly humbled by it. <clears throat> but in the same breath, I know the journey that I took to get here. Right. And I know that I bust my butt to get here. But it also leaves me humbled because I'm grateful. I'm grateful to you, I'm grateful to you, I'm grateful to AI, I'm grateful to Kobe, I'm grateful to Shaq. I'm grateful to a host of professional athletes across the world, across all spectrums of the sports world who always reached back to help me. And so for me, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's very, very special to me because all those people called to say you deserve this, mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. And so I recognize that. And what it lets me know is don't fade, don't go away from what I did to get myself here. We need you even more now. That's right. <laughs> That's right. The responsibilities haven't lessened. Yeah. They've elevated. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's okay because now more than ever before, I'm in a position where I'm going to be able to reach back and to give a helping hand because I got more people listening to me right. than ever before. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, it says to me, all right, Steve, you ain't perfect. You make mistakes just like everybody else. But the grind that you on, stay on that grind and always remember how you got here. And more importantly than that, help those brothers and sisters that want to be helped, mm -hmm. you know, and beyond. They ain't just black folks, it's white folks, right. it's everybody. Right. But I am partial to my own in regards to the fact that there are a small number of us right. that have been able to really, really do it. So it's not anti-anything. It's not anti-white, it's not anti-Asian, Hispanic, or anything like that. But I'm a black man. And so for me, I'm going to always, always want to help my own in the best way that I possibly can. And I think the greatest way to do it is by really highlighting and identifying the minefields that can really knock you off whatever pedestal you're aiming to get on. If you don't, the greatest disservice you could do to your own community is to never tell them about the minefields. Right. Just let them go on and Blow let them do what they're going right. to do. Mm -hmm. Never say a word. I don't do that. I'm going to make sure that I let cats know, yo, come here. Just so you know, right. this is what's going on. You need to mind what's going on here. And that's what I'm going to do to y'all. If I see y'all, <laughs> y'all yeah. doing this podcast and everything, and this ain't the only thing y'all going to be doing, because y'all got something special here. I'm telling you, this is special. Appreciate it. This is special what y'all got going here. I mean that. This is big time I'm stuff. Because y'all y'all work. Y'all really, really work together. And it's a beautiful thing to see. But 
if I see y'all going in the wrong direction, you'll hear from me. <laughs> we, I know it. Be we like, better hear from you. Know what, I mean? like, what you doing? <laughs> yeah. Like, what you doing? What's right. up? We better hear we from We got to talk. What's going on? Right. Well, we want to thank you, man. Uh, like I said, Jack mentioned earlier, but we really do appreciate you. Like I said, we don't always agree, but we appreciate the path, the journey. We got to learn a little, a lot more today. Right. Um, and we look up and aspire to be you now. And you hear we worked with someone a couple of weeks ago that came on set and he's like, I want to be the next Stephen A. Smith. You know what I mean? So we just, just like I said, give you your flowers right here. Hats off to you, man. Keep doing what Appreciate you're doing you, and keep holding it down, man. Thank and you. Boomer Assassin and Gio told me to tell you they love your work. Yes. Boomer Assassin, he made it a point. I was going to say they made it a point for me to tell you yeah. you do great work and he appreciates your he's good work. He's a great guy. I mean, he does, um, he does a great job. He does a lot of philanthropic, philanthropic things and he deserves a lot of credit, him and his wonderful family. But I think that um, that means a lot to me because a couple of times it was like, I disagree with Boomer, but I went out of my way to make sure, ladies and gentlemen, I disagree with this, <laughs> yeah. not him. Not him. You know what I'm saying? And I think that there's more of that that people need to learn to grasp. That's what we talk about when you can agree without being disagreeable. You know, mm -hmm. we don't really disagree mm -hmm. about the whole we. No, thing. not we, at all. We, we really, I mean, I get it. I totally you understand. There, yeah. Particularly as you explain, mm -hmm. you're right. Mm -hmm. I was ignorant to it. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, but I have my beliefs. You have yours. But y'all gonna always be my brothers, man. And right. we and, and we good. And we, guess what? Iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. If we all agree with everything, how do we ever oh, learn? And we, don't we don't elevate yeah. that way. You don't elevate that way. Doesn't work. That's a wrap, man. Episode eight, New York. Stephen A, man, we can't thank you enough, man. Great to be here. Check us out, Showtime Basketball YouTube, or all platforms that stream podcasts. All of them. All of them. My all man, them. appreciate you. No doubt. Thank you.